today our focus is on East Africa. So um, my name is Sydney, I'm, I'm in Kenya, and uh, today we have three talks lined up. So I hope you guys are going to enjoy them. So the first talk of the evening is from Dr. Laban Joroge, who is the head of the Invertebrate Zoology Department or Invertebrate Zoology Section at the National Museums of Kenya. And he's going to be talking about dragonflies. So without further ado, on to you, Laban. Thank you very much, uh, Sydney. No, and I hope everyone is fine. So I think I'll just go straight uh, to sharing my my PowerPoint. Let me know if you can see it. Can you see it? Yes, we can. Is it full now? Sorry. Yes, it is. To go to the. <laughs> I shouldn't have done that. That's the beginning, sorry for that. So um, I, I think I'm introduced and I don't have to go back to the introduction. Uh, in several of, you know, talks in this fora, uh, we, I've shown you different uh, areas I've been to in Kenya where I've been collecting dragonflies. And uh, I've shown you different species uh, in Africa of uh, dragonflies and damsel flies. But then we, we thought uh, it would be a good idea if we discussed uh, the biology of these creatures. Yeah, because uh, not everybody here is an entomologist. So we thought uh, uh, it would be nice and also important for people to also hear the, uh, the, the, the interesting biology uh, these creatures that we call the uh, uh, dragonflies. So on the on the cover page is one of my favorite uh, uh, spots uh, of dragonfly hunting in Kenya because I have many, and this is the uh, the Abadeas ranges of mountains. It's in central Kenya, and uh, it's it's home to several uh, global and country endemics uh, of dragonflies. So it's one of my favorite uh, spots. And um, I also have several other sports of uh, collecting dragonflies. And I, I, I know you're used to me presenting from my house in Nairobi. I'm not in Nairobi at the moment. I'm actually uh, at the floor of the Great Rift Valley in a small town by the shores of Lake Naivasha uh, up there. You can see it. And uh, the, the town itself goes by the same name, uh, Naivasha Town. And uh, it's, it's, it's famous for the flower, you know, growing. If you come from Europe, chances are the roses that you buy are from Lake Naivasha in Kenya. And that is me in one of the farm, rose farms actually, uh, there where they use the, you know, the water from the lake to do all the horticulture and water view. So I've been lucky to collect in this lake and several other lakes that dot the uh, you know, the Rift Valley. So to the north of the, of the lake, we also have uh, a few more. We've got Elementaita, we've got Lake Nakuru. Uh, we've got, um, got to minimize something. Yeah, we've got uh, uh, Lake Baringo also to the north. And further north, we have uh, Lake uh, 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 Bogoria and Baringo. So I've been collecting uh, dragonflies over many years. Uh, in what we are calling the dragonflies of the Rift Valley Lakes. And this was in a project within a project funded by Earthwatch uh, International. Uh, now uh, it's completed, it's come to an end, and the project was called the Lakes People and the People of the Rift Valley. So that is me actually, long time ago, during the project, doing the collection of the, uh, of the ordinates in the lakes of the Rift Valley. Uh, up there is the uh, Shampore Swamp, for those who know Shampore. It's just next to, you know, the tip of Lake Natron that is within the Kenya. Much of it is within Tanzania, but uh, uh, there's a bit of it that is within uh, Kenya. And down there, the two photos down there is Lake uh, Baringo. Now, it's during one of those expeditions that I collected the only specimens of Phylomacromia africana or the Sahel Quisa. And uh, 
that's how important those expeditions were because this is a new record for Kenya. And uh, this was before I came to know about ADO. For those who know the ADO website, ADO stands for um, Africa Dragonfly and Damselfly Online, which is quite a good resource uh, for uh, the ordinates. So this is, was long before I came to know about it. And as you can see, the, the record is already, you know, uploaded by myself uh, onto the other website. So that is the only specimen from Lake uh, Baringo that I collected during those times. Now, like I said, everybody here is not an entomologist and therefore it is nice to give you just a brief introduction to uh, what dragonflies are. And of course, these are insects. Yeah, dragonflies are insects. And they belong to the <coughs> an order of insects, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> that we call uh, Odonata. Now, the <coughs> name Odonata comes from a Greek word meaning tooth. And as you can see from the photo that these creatures have got very intimidating uh, teeth. Uh, even when you have them at hand, they at times try to bite you, but they cannot, uh, they, they do not bite. Uh, at least it's good to put it straight, that they do not uh, bite, although they have very intimidating teeth. And this is where the name of the order comes from. It comes from the uh, Greek word, uh, odon, meaning tooth. And the order odonata includes both the dragonflies and the damselflies. And at times we just, uh, you know, prefer to call them ordinates instead of keeping on saying dragonflies and damselflies. So at times we just uh, prefer to just call them uh, uh, ordinates. So every time I mention dragonflies, just know I'm referring to both the dragonflies and the damselflies. Now, although these creatures go by the name fly, they are not true flies. Uh, they are not true flies. You know, if you imagine the house fly or say a sister fly or a field fly or soldier fly, you know, the members of what we call the order diptera, which is uh, another order of insect, order diptera. So these are not uh, true flies, so they're not dipterans like we had they are in the order, their own order called Ordonata. And uh, of course, we have a clever way of separating the true flies uh, from the false flies in the way we write the names. Uh, you see those two words are written as one continuous word, damsel flies and dragon flies, continuous word. Whereas the members of the uh, diptera, meaning the true flies, are two separate words, uh, as a house fly or say a sister fly, two separate words. Now, these creatures are among the most ancient of insects, together with their close cousins uh, or relatives, if you like, or the mayflies, which are also uh, aquatic, you find them in water. So we've got records dating back many, many years back of uh, uh, dragonflies from the fossils, as you can see in that fossilized uh, specimen and also in the amber. So we, uh, yeah, from the, from the Carboniferous period, which is a period which is uh, uh, 350 uh, uh, million years ago. That's, that's, yeah, that's quite a long uh, time ago. So uh, we've got those records when these creatures were huge, very huge compared to the modern day dragonfly, which is sort of, uh, you know, smaller in size. And we say the creatures that we find in the fossils were dragonfly like, yeah, yeah, there were a little bit of, you know, differences uh, between it and the modern day dragonfly. Yeah, and one of the difference is that uh, they lack something we call the pterostigma. Now the pterostigma, for those who don't know it, is a blood spot, you know, that you find in each and every wing of the ordinates yeah at the tip you know at the extreme uh, edge edges of the wing so these are the pterostigmas and uh, they are thought to aid you know in the fly they are they are they're, they're thought to be sort of weight you know weights so that uh, prevents the the warbling of the wings uh, when these creatures are, are are in flight so the asian dragonflies lacked the pterostigmas which are those spots that we find in a modern day 
uh, dragonflies. Now, just uh, a little bit of the basic taxonomy of the creatures. Uh, the order again is Ordinata. I need not repeat that, but it's separated into three sub uh, orders. You know, the, 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 the level that is just below the order. So the three are Anisoptera, and then we've got the Zygoptera, and another one we call the Anisozygoptera. Now, the, uh, the, the sub order Anisoptera is what uh, comprises all the dragonflies, uh, or what most people know as the dragonflies. And then the Zygoptera, which is the other order, is where the damsel flies uh, belong. And then we have one that sort of the intermediate. So it, it, the, the members of this uh, suborders have got uh, features, you know, features that are in between uh, the dragonflies and also the, the damselflies. And this is the Aniso, uh, Aniso Zygoptera. We don't have it in Africa or any other continent. They are Asian and you find them up in the Himalayas. So uh, it's, it's not something that you're going to see uh, in Africa. So I'll talk a little bit about the, <clears throat> a few more differences between the, the two suborders. And we are going to ignore the Anisozygoptera because uh, we do not have it in Africa. I myself have never seen, you know, one. Uh, I think I may have seen one when I visited uh, a museum in China. But uh, uh, we are going to discuss the two that we have here in Africa and therefore in East Africa. So the dragonflies, which are in the suborder Anisoptera, and the Zygopterans, which are damselflies. So what are the differences between these two? Um, to a keen eye, the differences are so obvious, and I'll take you through them one by one. And the first one is in the sense that uh, the dragonflies are robust, they are, they are, they are well built, they are bigger than the damselflies, which are sort of uh, quite slender, as you can see, or uh, to your, I believe to your right. Yeah, so um, the damselflies are quite slender creatures, and then uh, they are uh, cousins, dragonflies, quite well built. Then the other difference is on the wings. Uh, the shape of the wing, the forewing and the hide wing in dragonflies is not the same shape. So here we are talking about the shape, uh, not the color or, or the size, but uh, the shape. So if you look at that dragonfly, the, the hide wing and the, the, the forewings are not the same. The hide wings are a little bit broader at the base, looking like a machete or something like that. Whereas uh, the wings of uh, damselflies are all, all the same shape. If you put them together, if you just tie them together, you would think you're seeing only one wing. So that's another difference between the, uh, the two creatures. And then the other difference would be on their eyes. If you look at the eyes of a dragonfly, which are quite huge, and actually they, they almost occupy the entire head of a dragonfly, and that's why these guys are, you know, marvelous uh, hunters. Their vision is superb, and uh, as you can see from uh, the photo there, their eyes, you know, occupy almost the entire uh, uh, head, and they can see from all directions apart from backwards. Backwards, you know, behind them is the only direction they cannot see. And their head is, you know, so flexible that they can turn almost 360 degrees. And if you collect tron flies, you might even think the head is falling off. No, it's not falling off. It's just a, a, an adaptation for uh, good hunters to have a very nice, you know, view. And uh, the eyes of a dragonfly is touch at the top, as you can see from the diagram. Uh, whereas those of terms of flies are far apart. There's a distance in between them, uh, as you can see. There's an area that separates the two eyes in a terms of flies. Uh, the only uh, exception within the drone flies is a family we call Gonfidi, who are, whose eyes have a small you know, area separating them. Yeah, but when you see gonfids or the club tears, you don't confuse it with damselflies. You don't, uh, you don't say it's a damselfly because their eyes are far apart, they are separated, no, because they are robust and also the wings, you know, are not of the same shape, the hide wing and the forewing. 
Yeah, and uh, also one difference I almost forgot about the wings is that when at rest, the dragonflies would have their wings open permanently through, throughout their adult life. Yeah, they will never close their wings. Whereas those of dragonflies are sort of uh, put together above the, uh, the abdomen. So that's another uh, difference between the two creatures. So next time you see them, I'm sure you'll be able to spot and, uh, the differences and be able to tell which is a damselfly and which is a, a dragonfly. And the, the differences go, go on to their young ones, as you can see in the, in the images uh, over there. I put uh, quite, several, uh, quite a number of images of the adults as well. And uh, just refreshing you, our memories, you can see the damsel flies up there, quite slender. And just look at the, the positioning or the wings, you know, they're not held out horizontally like those of the uh, dragonflies. And then they are lovely, or the nymphs, and people prefer to use the word nymph, uh, are equally slender, as you can see. Uh, down there we've got now the dragonflies proper, and uh, they are robust, well built. And uh, uh, equally built are their young ones, and uh, they come in all shapes, they come in all sizes, depending on the species, depending on the genus, depending on the families. So they, they, they will be of different uh, shapes and uh, sizes. Now just a little bit about uh, the life cycle of these creatures. It's, it, they, they've got a simple uh, life cycle. And yesterday, who had, uh, those, for those who attended the, uh, the talk yesterday, we, 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 we heard about the life cycle of our butterfly. Yeah, so the, the, the difference between that of a dragonfly and a butterfly that you had yesterday is in the fact that uh, this one lacks <coughs> one stage, which we call the pupil stage. So in science, we say it, it follows what we call an incomplete you know, metamorphosis, uh, unlike the others that uh, follow the complete one, uh, comprising of egg, and then they have the larval stages, and then they've got the larvae turning into a pupae, and then the pupae will emerge into a winged adult. So this one of dragonflies and the damselflies lack, uh, lacks that stage of the pupae. So what happens is that the female will lay the eggs, and then the eggs would hatch into very tiny, very tiny indeed uh, uh, nymphs. Some people prefer to call them larvae. And then the larvae will go through, you know, developmental stages, getting bigger every time, bigger and bigger, until it gets to the last stage, larval stage or nymph stage, and never going to the pupil stage. So it is the last stage of the larvae that you have a slit at the back of the thorax and out, you know, wrinkles the winged adult. So uh, the other two mature, of course, they would mate, and then the female would lay eggs again and the cycle would repeat, such a simple, uh, you know, life cycle. So these creatures have got, uh, uh, you know, uh, spent the, 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 the terrestrial lives and also have got a stage that is aquatic as you can see, and that's why you always find them uh, next to the waters. Yeah, yeah, at least fresh water, not, not, not uh, salt water. So you don't have any species breeding in the, uh, the seawater. None is marine at all. So they've got an aquatic uh, face, and then they've got the uh, terrestrial face. And I'm sure most of you just know the terrestrial face or the terrestrial faces of these creatures. If you want to see the aquatic faces, then you've got to do the aquatic collections or sampling. Uh, that's me doing the, the sampling uh, up in uh, rivers coming from Mount Kenya, the one on the left, I believe it's your left, that's uh, River Tegu, uh, Degu from Mount Kenya and the, the, the right one, uh, the right one is uh, River Sagana, also from the same mountain. So if you want to see the aquatic stages of all the nets, uh, unfortunately, you have to get a pond net or aquatic net, kick net, uh, whichever you have, and then you have to do an aquatic sample. Now I'll discuss uh, briefly about the interesting behaviors, uh, because these creatures have got uh, quite a number of uh, interesting behaviors. So I think uh, I would like to discuss basking and then we talk about their feeding behavior, 
how they meet and uh, this uh, terrestrial marking that is so common among the dragonflies. So dragonflies love sun. Yeah, at least a good number of them love sun. I say that there is a good number of them because I know there's some shade loving uh, species, but they're not, uh, they're not many uh, in number. So uh, in the morning when you go, you know, out and uh, uh, it's sunny, you are likely to see dragonfly just basking in the sun. So it's common for almost all invertebrates to warm up you know, before the activity starts. So this is basically what uh, they're also doing. And uh, immediately after warming up, that's when they will take off because the muscles will be able to uh, to work, you know, the flight muscles, and therefore they can start feeding. So before they start feeding, they will be basking in the morning sun, quite early in the morning. And then uh, after that, they will be feeding almost uh, throughout, you know, and then when it gets very hot later in the day, you must have, ob uh, must have observed this kind of behavior. And this is another posture they take. We call the obstetric posture of the ordinate uh, for both dragonflies and the damselflies, whereby it's almost starting on its head, you know, you know, straight with the abdomen pointing towards the overhead sun. Now, this is a behavior that uh, prevents overheating of the, uh, of the, of the dragonflies and um, they're basically trying to have as little surface area exposed to the sun and I think this is very clever because then uh, it would mean they will not overheat. So this only happens during the hot of the day and uh, usually when the sun is uh, overhead, not, not when it's not overhead. So next time you go to the field, you must uh, observe that during the hot of the day. Now, dragonflies feed their ferocious hunters, probably the most dreaded of all insects. And um, as you can see, they catch their prey in flight. Yeah, because movement is very key for them to know that this is food. Otherwise, if, if, if an insect or whatever they're feeding on is dead, they will not be able to tell that this is food. And like say the cockroaches that would use uh, their sense of smell to tell that this is a piece of cake, whether it is moving or not, and therefore it would feed on it or the ants uh, and other you know, groups of creatures. No, not so for the dragonflies. So for them, they rely on the movement or their prey to know or to realize or to make a decision that this is indeed food. As you can see that um, a mosquito being caught, a blood-fed mosquito, and then um, they feed on other creatures, including their own. As you can see down there, there's a, a, a dragonfly feeding on a, on a damselfly. In fact, they also feed on, the, you know, dragonflies themselves. So they feed on anything that can be eaten. And then the aquatic stages are equally good hunters, the roaches, and uh, they feed on other insects as well, but they also feed on other things like tadpoles and small fish, uh, as you can see over there. So they go this thing underneath the mouth, which we call the labia, uh, sometimes called the mask, uh, which is very well packed underneath the chin. And uh, it is quickly opened, more or less the same with a, a, a chameleon, you know, opens the tongue and catches uh, something very quickly. So that's the same way or the same mechanism the, the, the ordinates use when they are in their aquatic stages. So they would also feed on, you know, uh, their own, you know, smaller instances of dragonflies. Yeah, and uh, it's, it's uh, during this stage that they really do the number of biting and nuisance, you know, uh, mosquitoes. So uh, we credit them for that. And that goes so much unappreciated. People don't appreciate the fact that if you, and this is what I usually tell people, if on average you had say uh, 10 bites from mosquitoes, these bites would have been hundreds. Why it's not for such creatures that try to reduce the num numbers of the, of the biting uh, creatures like mosquitoes. So the mating 
egg laying and the emergence of these creatures. The mating of ordinates, both dragonflies and damselflies, is one of the most bizarre of any creatures. I'm sure if you go to a water body, you may have seen uh, some creatures that are in that position, uh, sometimes patched, at times flying together, you know, without antagonizing each other in a very well coordinated manner. The one behind is always the female, of course, and uh, if you're an experienced entomologist, you can only, uh, you can tell from the color, but if you're not, you can tell from the one that is behind, that is a female, and the one in front is always, uh, it's always uh, the male, never the other way around. Yeah, so why do they meet in such a bizarre way? Now, equally bizarre is the fact that uh, Male dragonflies have got two sets of sex organs or genitalia, if you like, and one it's at the tip, just like all the other insects, you know, uh, and we call that the primary genitalia right at the tip. And then in addition to the primary genitalia, we've got a secondary genitalia, which is sort of uh, at the beginning of the, of the abdomen. Yeah, that's why they, we have the secondary genitalia. So why have two sets of genitalia? The reason is uh, the gametes, just like for all the other insects, or the sperms, if you like, are produced at the primary genitalia, right at the tip. So um, this is where the gametes are produced. And uh, when they're mating, the male, grasps or grasps the female by the neck using the same primary genitalia. So it becomes impractical to hold the female with the genitalia and use the same genitalia to mate. So what they do just before they mate, they coil the tip of their abdomen. I'm discussing the males now uh, that produce the gametes. They coil the tip of the abdomen and empty everything into the secondary genitalia that I said is right at the beginning of the abdomen. So this is more or less like a storage, you know, uh, the secondary genitalia uh, is more or less like a storage. And what that one mean, means is that now the primary genitalia is free, is free to hold the female. And during the mating, the male will grasp uh, the female by the neck using the uh, uh, the claspers, yeah, forceps-like structures at the tip of the abdomen. And in turn, the female will coil her genitalia, which is only at the tip, it doesn't have a secondary genitalia, and it will draw from the storage that is a secondary genitalia. And that's why you see them in this kind of uh, a very awkward uh, position, if I may put it that way. So, uh, that's if you want to tell the sexes apart very quickly, if you're maybe not experienced to tell the colors and what have you, and the colors may not be, especially when they are young, you may not know uh, the, the difference between the males and the females, you may not tell them apart. So if you want to tell uh, the difference with certainty is you look at the secondary genitalia. If a specimen doesn't have anything at the uh, area where the secondary genitalia is supposed to be, meaning it's flat, then that is a female. But then if it has a small swelling, meaning secondary genitalia straight away, that is a male. And that kind of uh, mating is not unique to the dragonflies. It's also the same case with the, with the, with the uh, damsel flies, as you can see over there. So the females, after mating, of course, the eggs will mature and it would want to lay them. So eggs are laid in aquatic environments, either directly into the water or very near the water. And uh, I know you used two females laying eggs, flying, hovering over the water, tapping, you know, doing the taps. And uh, when it's tapping the water, that's a female that is depositing eggs directly into the water. So it's sort of washing off, you know, the tip of the abdomen where the eggs are. However, in addition to the direct uh, depositing, some may just, just rest in the water, as you can see in that middle photo, uh, for some time. 
and uh, deposit all the eggs if they survive the fish and what the diving beetles so it will deposit all the eggs yeah but we also have got interesting ones that deposit their eggs in plant tissues living plant tissues as you can see in the uh, image over here so they've got some structures that make some incisions into the plant tissues and in there deposit uh, their eggs yeah but all these like i said happens in the aquatic environment so some males keep guard yeah when the females are laying as you can see uh, in this uh, orange tipped yellow wing uh, like name is Bowie. so the male is still keeping uh, God, that this female deposit their eggs. Yeah, dragonflies are thought to compete even for, you know, fertilization. Yeah, they 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 are known, and I think there's evidence that they they they, they even the male discusses the sperms of the male that had met mated with the female before it. It discusses those sperms and put inputs his sperm. So, uh, to avoid all that unnecessary you know, work, some males just decide to keep watch to ensure that no other male would mate with a female when she's laying the eggs. So the eggs who hatch under the life cycle, like I explained it, would um, uh, start and uh, get to, to the end. So what happens when the last lava stage, you know, is attained, uh, they make an incision right at the back of the thorax and and uh, like I explained, out comes a winged adult that will remain there for some time. Remember, it's a week, it cannot fly. So it will stay there, you know, motionless for some time to harden. And then, of course, they will pump the blood, their blood into the wings uh, and uh, to get them into, you know, into position. So one quick way of telling a uh, newly emerged uh, dragonfly or damselfly is, is, is the weakness. I mean, they are, they are, they are very fragile. They cannot, uh, they cannot fly and to, 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 to attach, they are very, very soft. Again, their wings are very shiny. You see them even when they attempt flying, they'll be very shiny in the sun, as you can see, looking like a new silverish coin. And we give them a name, Tenero. Newly emerged dragonflies are called Teneros. You know, like a general, you replace G with a T, Tenero. So now to the behavior of territory marking. Yeah, this is very, very common among the dragonflies. And this is the reason you keep on seeing them chase each other, especially the males. So what happens is that they would normally identify a landmark, which is uh, in most cases a twig, a, a stick, you know, yeah, or, or a stone or something they can rest on. And they would mark uh, a, a small territory that, you know, that is only a few meters from where it is and to which no other male should venture. That's why you see every time another male tries to, you know, to get within the boundaries of the mud small territory, it is chased away yeah, by the male. And the chaser comes back after the chasing, comes back to the same, same, same spot. They have an incredible way of, you know, identifying the landmark. And these uh, territories are not permanent. Yeah, because that dragonfly will move a few meters away and identify another one and very quickly identify another territory to which no other male should venture. So the, the, the territories are not permanent. Yeah, uh, they are very temporal. Now, uh, these are sort of, I thought I should just show you the various uh, habitats of dragonfly. They are varied, they are varied, the, uh, the species uh, themselves. And one interesting thing is the fact that one can create a dragonfly habitat, even right within you, uh, your homes, you can create a very nice and productive, you know, artificial uh, dragonfly habitat. So uh, to end, uh, yesterday there was a mention, uh, there was a question about the, the, when butterflies, you know, are active in South Africa. And I thought uh, I an, uh, anticipated maybe such a, or a similar question uh, among the dragonflies in East Africa. And I thought I should uh, uh, show you this, that uh, our main activity follows the rains. 
uh, probably just like anywhere else. And our long range here in East Africa, um, March through to May. And uh, as you can see, that's when the highest uh, uh, level activity is. And then uh, during the rains that come later in the year, we call them short rains. And this is October to November. And uh, those are the two, you know, two periods when you, you can actually have, you know, good time uh, watching or collecting dragonflies uh, in Kenya. So thank you very much. Thank you, Laban. That was, that was quite uh, interesting, quite fascinating. Um, so 